Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Not Another Bucking Podcast. I'm Nick Kosmider, your host, Broncos beat writer at The Athletic. And as we've rolled into the second full week of Broncos training camp, obviously the big news this week was that Tim Patrick, the veteran wide receiver who missed all of last year due to an ACL tear, um, he suffered a tear of his Achilles tendon um, on Monday. That injury is going to keep him out for the season for the second straight year. Devastating blow, first and foremost, to Patrick, who was an undrafted free agent in 2017, You know, worked his way onto the roster from the practice squad, and eventually earned a three-year, $30 million contract in November of 2021, um, but has not played since the start, uh, since the end of that season due to these, due to these injuries. Um, but you know, life in the NFL becomes, where do the Broncos turn next? I think they're more equipped for this injury than they were a year ago. I, I think the depth at wide receiver, um, sort of an intentional um, overhaul there in terms of the spots behind Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy this offseason. Uh, Brandon Johnson is an undrafted free agent who I think Broncos fans are going to hear a lot about this season. I, I firmly believe he's going to make the roster uh, at this point. He's had a great camp, and I think he's going to be a guy that might be in line to be their number three wide receiver this year, obviously, Marvin Mims is a guy they're high on because they drafted him in the second round out of Oklahoma. Um, but I think rookies and Sean Payton's offense uh, it tends to take a little time. He says there's been guys that flash right away and become productive right away. And, and Mims certainly has, I think, the speed and talent to be that guy. Um, but but I think probably more likely that he comes along a little bit slower. Uh, will certainly be on the roster again as a second round pick. Um, but then the interesting battles happen from there, right? Who else on this, on this 90 man roster is going to be in that room when week one arrives in September 10th, Marquez Callaway, you have to think he has a good shot given that he has been a leading wide receiver in Sean Payton's offense before in 2021, um, 2021, uh, 2021 is a weird way to say that, but, um, he is a guy that I think, again, solid wide receiver knows the offense, um, certainly has, has a shot. Um, if this injury had occurred maybe during the offseason program, I think perhaps the Broncos go out and scour that wide receiver market a little bit, but largely believe they're going to try to handle these lo the loss of Patrick and KJ Hamler, who for right now is not on the roster. Uh, he was waived with a uh, non-football illness designation due to a heart condition that um, they hope can be treated within a month uh, with medication. Um, but again, I think had those had these absences occurred you know, earlier in the offseason, perhaps the Broncos would be looking for outside help. But I think this is going to be largely addressed uh, with guys they already have in this room. Uh, other big thing with this week is just just the offense trying to kind of graduate to the next steps. This today on Wednesday was the first time that the Broncos have done a red zone in this camp. And it was certainly a mixed bag in the first session for the first team. Russell Wilson was out there, um, you know, threw a nice pass to Cortland Sutton that would have got the Broncos down to about the five yard line. It came on a, a sort of a, a, a sprint run left. Um, you know, bought himself a little bit extra time and then hit Cortland Sutton down the sideline. Wilson also had another play where he, um, you know, his first couple options weren't there and quickly decided to take off and run through a big hole on the right side. Um, I think that's what the Broncos want to see. They want to see him using his legs in a decisive way, right? Not necessarily as, you know, scrambling all over the place and then turning up field, but just identifying quickly when that is the best option and then taking off from there. I think that's something that has been a concerted uh, effort with him, and we've already seen it a little bit in training camp. Second red zone period of the day, not as good for the first team offense. You know, Russell Wilson had an opportunity to hit Jerry Judy uh, kind of in the flat uh, with sort of a catch and run for a score type opportunity, overthrew him, had another pass for Cortland Sutton, get knocked down, and then was intercepted by Kwan Williams, the nickel corner who continues to have a really strong camp, like a lot of people, a lot of players in this Broncos secondary. Um, you know, it, it's it's not been smooth for this offense, but I don't think that that was a, you know, sort of a fair realistic expectation that this was a group that was going to come in from day one of training camp and, and look like world beaters. Um, they've got a lot of habits from from last year and years prior that, that Sean Payton and his staff are trying to iron out. They're installing a, you know, kind of a complicated offense. They're trying to push the tempo. There's a lot on the plate of these players who are trying to digest everything. And they're going up against a defense that that has a lot of continuity, both in terms of um, personnel retention and also with with schematic retention. And that Vance Joseph, a lot of the scheme that he's running is similar to to what the Broncos had in 2022 with the Giro Evero. So I, I think the fact that the, the offense is struggling for me, it's not panic alarms at this point. Russell Wilson 
hasn't looked great, but I think one some of the things you are seeing in terms of again, again the decisiveness, the opportunities that he's taking uh, to become a threat and, and make himself a threat against defenses with his legs, that's been a positive development. Cortland Sutton, I think, has had a really nice camp. The veteran wide receiver, he he looks, I think, as good at this stage in the season as I've seen him in the last few years. Um, and then the running game, I think that is that is the, the point that I think at times gets lost with with all the talk about Russell Wilson is that this is a group that really wants to run the ball well at, at all phases. And Sean Payton today talked about that, particularly, um, you know, when it, when it came to the red zone. Um, so I'm going to get to that clip here in just a second. And when we come back, um, our next guest is, is an old friend of mine, Ryan O'Halloran, covered the Broncos for a long time as a member of the Denver Post, now works for the Buffalo News. He's been on kind of a whirlwind um, camp tour that's hit a lot of uh, teams that are AFC playoff hopeful. So I thought it would be good to bring him on and kind of take a take a look at the AFC playoff picture preseason wise and get some of his thoughts on that. So we'll get to Ryan in a second. But first, let's go back again to Sean Payton talking about the Broncos red zone work on Wednesday and what they ultimately want to accomplish in that part of the field. First day in the red zone, you know, obviously the the trick there is you have to be good running the football. You know, we went through the, the top 10 teams last year offensively and defensively in the red zone. And, and we talked to them about like all the specific, the specifics. Um, it's a pretty important uh, special situation in our game. You know, good red zone teams, typically are in the playoffs. So before we pitch it to the interview with Ryan, just want to apologize for some of the audio issues you're going to hear. Uh, Ryan was in the airport due to a scheduling conflict. And so we, we did the best we can to clean some of that up, but just a heads up, there are some audio difficulties with some of this interview. All right. Thrilled to uh, welcome our guest here for episode three, of not another bucking podcast. Uh, old pal, Ryan O'Halloran, who uh, covered the Broncos for, for several years here at the, when he worked at the Denver post. So, has a good familiarity with the team, uh, now works at the Buffalo News as a columnist covering the Bills, um, and then spent the last, you know, almost two weeks um, circumventing the, the, the East Coast, uh, visiting a lot of AFC type playoff, AFC playoff type teams and, and getting a read on on what the landscape looks like there. But uh, Ryan, man, good to good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Yeah. Is it, is it me, Nick, or do these camps get longer? They get longer. I mean, man, we're I, I, I was trying to remember, like last year you were in camp, you, you covered uh, Nathaniel Hackett's training camp. Um, we had a stretch of 10 practices in 11 days. I don't, I don't remember having one quite like that. But Well, and then like last camp uh, is probably around this time of year where we dashed to Minneapolis for the ownership vote. Right, right. And, uh, and, and, and then so we covered that. And, but I remember, I remember it was probably the year before you came back. Was the uh, it was Vic Vic Fangio's first year in nineteen where they played the Hall of Fame game. Yeah. So so they so they played five games and then opened up two weeks before camp. It was it was brutal. So but, I remember. Yeah, I remember people talking about that. Like it was it was the camp that would never end. But you know, I'm just curious from your perspective. You were at Jets camp um, a couple days ago. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers had what he had to say, calling uh, Sean Payton's comments about Nathaniel Hackett very surprising. He said he was you know disappointed in it. Um, what was just your read from being there at Jets camp and, and, and sort of the reaction that, that existed there about Sean Payton's comments? Yeah, I talked to one member of the organization who said Hackett was rattled by it, and, and that's that's human nature. He should have been because that came out of left field. You don't see coach-on-coach coach crime like that very often. And you know, I happened to be at Jets camp on Sunday, which was when Aaron Rodgers was on NFL Network, and he unloaded on Payton and said uh, – Keep, keep keep my coach's name out of your mouth, but I thought the favorite term of year is he, he called Sean Payton insecure. <laughs> so so I, I got a kick out of that. But uh, and so then you know Rogers uh, said his piece to the New York media after Tuesday's practice, I believe it was, and then Hackett, you know, took the high road in, in, in his briefing. But it, it, it you know it did send a shockwave through the league because it is so rare and. You know, and and I, I just think it was there was the you know Nathaniel Hackett, you know, he was drugged through the coals last year, probably deservedly. He didn't even make it through the season. So, you know, one thing that struck me viewing the Broncos from afar is that Sean Payton has been has been all about looking ahead. Hey, we're in the present. We're 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 about this team, not what not what's happened since the Super Bowl year eight years ago. Yet he wants to relitigate last year, and um, so I, I thought it was. Uh, Usually you root for the story, but I didn't like this kind of story. 
Yeah, it was. And, you know, and it just it's one of those things that probably, um, you know, you had to have known it was going to keep going. Right. And then this will this will pop up again in week five when these two teams play each other. I think to his credit, he did sort of address that part of it when he, you know, kind of came back and, and talked about how he didn't show enough restraint. He, he kind of said that, right, like the hypocrisy of the fact that I have been telling you guys to stay out of the headlines. And then, and then here I am, the one that kind of goes and does it. Um, Peyton didn't respond to Aaron Rodgers' comments or Hackett's. He, he, after his sort of, you know, mea culpa um, the other day, he kind of came out and said, listen, we're just we're just moving on from now. So, okay, we'll, we'll put that to bed, Ryan, and move on from this. I, I'm just curious, before we get on to some of the, you know, the teams that you've been covering here in training camp, um, as a guy who, who covered training camp last year, covered the first few weeks of the season, um, you know, knows most of the personnel that are, you know, that is with the Broncos who, who kind of covers the league as a whole in your role as a columnist now. What just intrigues you most or what are you most curious about with the Broncos, um, you know, as they get going and, and move toward week one of September 10th? Well, I'll, I'll get a, I'll, we can probably go back to the quarterback because that would be the easy answer. But right now, you know, two weeks ago at this time, they thought receiver was a strength with, with uh, Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, and Tim Patrick. Tim Patrick goes down with the Achilles, so he's out for the season. Yeah, if, if they were counting on K.J. Hamler, then that's a mistake because he was already injured, and then he came up with this heart issue. So, I, you know, I, I mean, who knows if he's even in their plans for the future. But, but, and then you look at their roster, are they really equipped to play 12 personnel? I mean, Dulcich should be their starter. He's a playmaker. But do you put Albert O out there? Do you put Manhurts out there as, a, like, a blocker? So I think they're tr- – you know, they should have, they probably had to regroup a little bit and say, okay, what do you want this offense to be? As I flip it over to the defense, and, and Nick, it's one thing we talked about during the summer, they're counting on guys at the edge who have not been able to stay healthy ever. And that's yeah. Gregory, Clark, Browning, and then you have Benito who didn't really play at all last year. So that's an issue, is particularly in this division, where how can you produce a four-man rush with, the, with those players? So uh, that's what's got, that's what I'm going to be interested in with the Broncos early in the season. Yeah, and it's 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 certainly a, a, a component of holding your breath with those defensive guys, you know. Because I was out there the other day, Ryan, and you know they, they they're setting up, and, and at one point you look at the line, and you, and you have you have Randy Gregory on one side, you have Frank Clark on the other side, you've got DJ Jones inside, and, and, and Zach Allen next to him, and you look and you say that's a pretty effective group. Like that's that's a those are three or four guys that have healthy. They can they can disrupt you in various ways, and 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 we've seen some of that in camp already. Zach Allen, in particular, I think is going to be an upgrade from Draymond Jones. He's he's bigger. Uh, he, he's he's a little bit more physical in the run game. Um, you know, got, obviously has the familiarity with Vance Joseph. It's the only defensive coach he's played for in his NFL career. So I think I think the, the signs with him are good. Uh, but I agree with you. They cannot afford injuries. I think that's the thing that I look at the Broncos roster and say there's a lot of positives in terms of top end talent, right? There are guys who have experience, particularly on the defensive side of the football. Um, but, but that, that injury to Tim Patrick was a reminder that you start scratching beyond that surface and, and you could have problems receiver wise. Cortland Sutton's got to stay healthy. Jerry Judy has to take another step from his last six games of the season last year uh, because they're going to count heavily on those guys. They want to be a better running team, but to your point, I agree. Like you're not going to be in 12 personnel 75% of the time. So, so I agree. Th- those, those to me, the, the depth part of it, um, you know, is a concern. Um, I wanted to have you on because I'm really curious about, you know, just sort of your insight getting to travel around and visit a couple of these uh, AFC teams that, that, you know, could definitely be um, problems in that playoff picture. I, I know you visited the Giants as well. Let's first start, though, Ryan, with, with Buffalo, um, you know, the team you cover on, on a consistent basis before you got out of town on this tour. Um, obviously, the, the Stephon Diggs thing was their big kind of offseason um, question mark. Uh, after the exit they had in the playoffs, there was clear tension there between he and the coaching staff and, and Josh Allen. Um, is Are we expecting a step back from, from this Buffalo team that won 13 games last year? Are they still a top tier uh, you know, AFC contender or, or, or have they dropped a little bit below the Chiefs and the Bengals? Where do you view them right now in August? Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be for, for the Bills uh... – they could be a better team and not have a better record because, you know, their road schedule is Miami, the Jets, New England, Cincinnati, the Chargers, Kansas City, Philadelphia. So they may not be favored in any of those. Maybe New England, that'd be the only one. So um, I think they got questions on defense is a corner. 
Tredavious White, a year, two years clear of ACL. Is he going to be back? Their number two corner, I think that's going to be up by committee. Uh, safeties is their strength with, with uh, Micah Hyde and Jordan Poirier and Taylor Rapp. As you go to offense, you mentioned the Diggs thing. I thought Diggs did a good, did a good thing in terms of just ending that for now by speaking on the first day of camp. Get his opinion out there. He was clearly not happy with Sean McDermott for basically – misleading the media say, well, he didn't report the minicamp. Well, he was. You just got done talking to him. So I think some things were needed to be said. Um, one thing at the league meeting is I asked around to executives and coaches that I know, and I said, what about the Bills a step back? And they said, as long as they got number 17, they're going to be a contender. And I agree with that. And he was very sharp during the first two days of camp. Watching him throw up close from the sidelines is like watching it like a bazooka get fired. I mean, he is just ha- he is just a unique ar- uh, thrower of the ball. So, I think the Bills are definitely in the mix. Um, although I'm I'm going to regret this, but I'm kind of bullish on the Jets because defensively they were, they were already there. They were playoff defense last year. They just didn't get anything at quarterback. Right. Let, so let's go into the Jets. What obviously you get a guy like Aaron Rodgers, not only the talent that he has had that he has shown throughout his career, but but just sort of the personality, everything that comes with him. Talking to people there, what, what's just the idea of how quickly, you know, he can be Aaron Rodgers with, with, this, with this new offense, even though it is obviously, like we know, one that he's familiar with from Green Bay? Yeah, and I think the, the transition for Rodgers is going to be Garrett Wilson, C.J. Zuma, the tight end. You know, the protections, you know, the, the concepts are probably going to be the same because of Nathaniel Hackett and Green Bay. But I think, you know, I hear, I hear some people compare it to, well, it's Russell Wilson and Denver. No. Come on, no, 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 no. Aaron Rodgers was the MVP two years ago. Yeah, so I think he's still a very good player. I think what you're going to see is a you know a passing game that is quick. You know, get it out of his hands, let his playmakers make plays. And I do think with Alan Lazard, um, with with Garrett Wilson, who I thought was very good as a rookie last year, you know, I think they can be very formidable. Dwayne Brown is on PUP at left tackle. We've got to get him healthy for the season. So. It's. Uh, I do think it's a. It's a three-team race in this division, the AFC East. Does Dalvin Cook end up with the Jets this season? Well, uh, the, the buzz around Jets camp is that he wants to be a Dolphin. That said, I think Dalvin Cook does end up with the Jets because I don't think Miami needs him as much as the Jets do. And if you're Dalvin, get into a camp. I wrote this in Monday's paper. Get into a camp, sign that one-year deal, be ready for the season. Then you can hit the market next year uh, with everybody else in March. So. Uh, that's I think he, he wants to go to the Dolphins, but I think he ends up with the Jets. Okay, let's move to the to the Jaguars. Obviously, the team that had the great comeback in the wild card round to defeat the Chargers last year. Um, I, I thought gave Kansas City a pretty tough game in the divisional round. A lot of expectations. You get Calvin Ridley on the team, um, adding another weapon for Trevor Lawrence. What's what's sort of the buzz around Jacksonville? Another place that you covered for a long time. Yeah, from 2012 to through the 17th season here in Jacksonville, um, you know, this practice on Wednesday, and we've seen it a hundred times, you, you go hard in pads for the first time and the next day is pretty sloppy. Well, that was the Jaguars on, on Wednesday. Calvin Ridley had four drops after being the star early on in camp. The Jaguars' issue is on defense. I think offensively with, with the weapons they have, Ingram at tight end, Etienne and Tank Bigsby at running back, obviously Lawrence, the receivers, they're going to score points. But the question I was asking people today is, are they going to stop anybody? They don't have enough pass rushers. And I think yet unique in Gakwe, a reunion with him makes a lot of sense if he lowers his price because they don't have that impact guy right now. And they also have they also have not a lot of corner depth after Tyson Campbell. So that's going to be – I think that's, that's the theme of Jaguars camp is can their defense match their offense? Where do you think? What do you think the biggest step that, that Trevor Lawrence needs to take this year is? I think the you know the way they made the playoffs last year is they had all these comebacks from double digit deficits. Well, that means you, that means offensively you're inconsistent. So I mean, you know, you know he threw some bad passes against the Broncos in the yeah. London game, and I thought I thought that was like a turning point to say, hey, you cannot do that anymore. So with a lot of young quarterbacks, it's uh, limiting the turnovers. And also not doing, you know, being more consistent early in games to give your defense a shot. Yeah. Uh, you're finishing your tour uh, heading to, to Miami. Obviously, Vic Fangio, who we both know well, is, um, is the defensive coordinator there this year. 
what do you think is the biggest like instant impact that he's going to make there? What, where, where will his um, sort of influence be felt the most for that defense? Well, uh, you know, he probably had plan A in mind, but then Jalen Ramsey got hurt. So now you, you're going to have to sort of regroup a little bit. They're, I think they're great in their front front seven. With you know, Jalen Phillips is a stud. I mean, he, I watching him in person last year twice, he was just all over the play. And Bradley Chubb, another former Bronco, uh, can you get him healthy? And so, you know, they they've got some different pieces, but you know, they can have a great defense. But it all comes down to Tua, and if he stays on the field, he was having a great season when he was healthy last year. But there's always going to be that hold your breath moment. I mean. He did things in the offseason that, you know, slide better and, you know, take less big hits. But, you know, they they want to run it more because they were the least balanced team in the league last year. Well, my comeback is you have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Yeah. You're going to not you're not going to have balance with those two two guys who are stars. So of the past three head coaches the Broncos have had, they rehired one to their to their staff this year in Vance Joseph. They played the other Vic Fangio in week three. They play the third Nathaniel Hackett in week five. Who do you think re- wants the revenge, you know, game more, uh, Vic Fangio in week three or Nathaniel Hackett in week five? Well, two weeks ago we would have said, hey, you know, maybe Vic. But <laughs> after Sean Payton couldn't shut up at you know, Nate Hackett, it's, you know, it's going to be like, uh, you know, Jefferson at fast times where, you know, he jumps over you know, three cars on his way to the quarterback or something like that. So, I think Nate Hack is going to be fired up for that game. Aaron Rodgers is going to be really fired up for that game. You know, Vic Fangio, you're two years removed. If I'm Vic, do you really think you got the shaft here in Denver? Probably not. You just didn't have very good quarterback play. So it, uh, you know, so that's, uh, so I would probably say Hack, it will have a little bit more of a burn in his saddle because it's such a fresh, fresh development. Okay, Ryan. Let me get your let me get your prediction for the Broncos in twenty twenty three. You know, does Russell Wilson bounce back, and, and what ultimately is going to be their record this year? Uh, I think he'll bounce back at a moderate level uh, because the the bar for that is so low, and you know, getting Javante Williams back for you know, what you hope is a full season that will help everybody on offense. Great, getting Greg Dulcich for a full season. I mean, you can see what kind of impact he made, and he may miss like the first five, six games. So, yeah, you know, I do, I do think this is maybe a seven and ten, you know, eight and nine team. The the Raiders just don't look like they have a lot going at all. So I think they would finish last, and so you know, seven and seven and ten, something like that. And you know, this you know, Sean Payton has to probably realize what he inherited is is not an overnight fix. So you know, try and get things headed in the right direction, get some continuity, and then, you know, and then make bigger strides in 2024. Yeah, I, I, I do think this is a build year for, for 2024. I, I think they can be a playoff team, but there, it's just so much that we're already seeing in camp that's going to have to break, right? Injuries being number one, something they have not been able to avoid for the last, you know, three plus seasons. Um, you know, I had picked them before, you know, uh, when the schedule came out at about at eight and nine. Before camp began, I, I, I pushed that to nine and eight because I thought that some of the additions that they made, um, you know, particularly adding adding Frank Clark, I, I think from people that I talked to in Kansas City, um, you know, he, he was really reinvigorated toward the end of last year. You saw it in the playoffs. Um, he believes he still has has a lot left. And, and he's a guy that I think gives you two Super Bowls worth of experience, something that they really haven't had on that side of the ball. But again, so much has to hit right. Um, Randy Gregory has to be a, a consistent impact player, and that's been a moving target for him uh, in his career. So far, you know, the, the, the addition of Zach Allen has looked like a, a hit. But again, these are these are early days. And, you know, I, I think ultimately the Broncos are going to have to get off to a quick start. They're going to need to win that opener against the Raiders. They're going to need to, you know, uh, beat the commanders at home in week two. They're going to have to go on the road in week four and, and beat the Jets um, you know, beat Miami in September in Miami is a tough, tough task, but they've got to be, you know, three and one, four and two, I think, in order to, to give themselves a shot. At the playoffs. Well, and, and we talked about injuries. I mean, as we talk, as we as we do this on Wednesday night, you know, Riley Moss is, is going to be out for what, a month or so. Yeah, well, when a rookie when a rookie misses that kind of time, it almost is like you're starting over. So, you know, that's another that that that, that impacts their depth yet again. And, 
you know, they, they spent so much money they, on their offensive line. It, it wasn't distributed, but they felt that needed to be fixed. So, you know, if, if, but if, if, if Wilson is, is off and, and, is try, and tries to do things he, he was able to do five, six years ago that he can't do now, this offense is going to be spinning its wheels. Yeah, it's, it's just, and I wrote this for tomorrow, it's going to be such an interesting study in, like, contrasting trends. Sean Payton throughout his career, if, if you go 2012 to 2021, um, they had the lowest time to throw of any team in the league. So from snap to throw, quickest in the league. Number 32 in that category was the Seahawks, obviously, with Russell Wilson as a quarterback. The, the Saints also had the lowest sack rate uh, across that same same duration. Seahawks, highest sack rate. Um, Broncos were 30th with Russell Wilson last year. So it's like, how far can Sean, Pay- Sean Payton bring Russell Wilson down to the way that he does things? If he can get him, you know, if they can meet somewhere in the middle of, of those two things, I think you give yourselves a chance. Um, but if it's if it's too too close to, to, to the to Wilson end, I, I think not enough else works in the offense. Well, I'll throw this at you. And, you know, we were not card-carrying members of the Denver Media Mafia, but they, they were made all in on Russell Wilson. What would have to happen for Peyton to go to Stidham? Not not injury. Not injury. I, I, I think it would. I, I think record would contribute to it. I, I think if you if you're two and four, two and five, and the offense isn't scoring more than 19 points a game, I think uh, particularly if you're not getting what you want to efficiency wise, I could see it mid season again. Russell Wilson has this early trigger in his contract in 2024, where if he's on the roster the fifth day of the 2024 league year his $37 million for 2025 becomes guaranteed. Oh. If, if they believe, if they believe after this year or at any point in this year, that it's not, it's not going to go beyond the 2023 season. I could see them pulling, pulling the plug and just saying we're, we're building towards something new. There's a lot of pressure on him. I, there, there's no doubt about it because Sean Payton knows what he wants. He knows what he he's, he has seen it, what he needs to see in terms of like, this is how we operate the offense. This is the quickness I need. Um, He's got to see those things from from Russell Wilson, and they got to win. Well, it's a great line in a movie. I can't remember what movie it is. You're not what I want. You're what I got. Right. And that could be the marriage right now. And uh, to me, and that that really is the biggest subplot of this Broncos season is the working relationship between Russell Wilson and Sean Payton. Yeah, and they have to continue to develop it. You know, they're, they're the thing they have going for them is that it's August second, but uh, September tenth is is quickly approaching. Ryan, thank you so much, man, for, for joining me from the, uh, the airport in Jacksonville. Good luck on the rest of your tour. And, um, you know, we'll see you uh, November 13th in Buffalo. That, that feels like nine miles, nine miles away. Uh, but next time I'll be in the, uh, in my office and we won't have these interruptions, but appreciate you. Appreciate uh, having me on Nick. All good. Well, that's, that's Ryan O'Halloran of the Buffalo news, follow his work, uh, you know, there and, and on Twitter. Uh, and as for the rest of you, we are going to have, um, you know, a mailbag episode of the podcast coming up soon. So submit your questions to you, to our Twitter account, leave them in the YouTube comments, however you want to get to us, and we'll go through them on the next podcast. Until then, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.